a ham radio station consists of these blocks. You got to be able to hear, you got to be able to talk. You don't listen and talk at the same time, typically with a ham station, although you can do something called full, full duplex if, under certain circumstances. And consequently, we can use one antenna, but we have to switch it back and forth between the receiver and the transmitter. Consequently, we need a transmit receive switch. It's maybe a manual switch. You may transmit for a while and then throw the switch to the other position, but in most cases, it's an automatic relay that's built into the radio. When you push the mic button, it automatically selects the antenna and moves it to the transmitter. And we typically need a source of DC to run our radios. The outlets give us AC, so we need a power supply to convert to 13.8 uh, volts or some similar number to uh, operate our radio. Connecting the radio, which is the dotted line, uh, to the antenna is a feed line or a transmission line, some type of special cable that is capable of carrying RF. Oh, this word here, transceiver, is made up of transmitter receiver. We put the two words together. So if we have the type of radio where all this is in one box, it is a transceiver. You could have a separate transmitter and a separate receiver if you wish. Okay, when we communicate with somebody, we have to do a couple things. For one thing, we have to generate a signal of some sort and send it out over the air. That is referred to as a carrier. We also have to put intelligence on it. Just the fact that we've transmitted a signal doesn't mean much to the person at the other end, other than, yep, there's a signal, somebody's transmitting. But I have no idea what the weather is, how, how he's doing. In order to know th those things, he has to do something to that signal to modulate it, to put information on it. <clears throat> we have to add voice to it, we have to add data, we can add video, we have to do something to that signal so that it means something to the receiving station. And the converse happens on receiving. We take that radio wave and we have to remove the information from it in order to hear what the guy at the other end is sending us, Morse code, video, audio, whatever it might be. That process is called demodulation or detection. More of this later. Don't be intimidated. There you go. We haven't done that yet, right? Everybody's with us? Okay. The very simplest way to send information is to take that transmitter and turn it off and on. And if we turn it off and on in some kind of a pattern that the guy at the other end can recognize, we are now signaling, we're sending information, and we typically use Morse code. We turn the transmitter on for short periods of time, that's a dot. We turn it on three times as long, that's a dash. So da 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 it's my call sign. We can do other things. Oop. Um, besides turning the transmitter off and on, which is the simplest way to communicate, we can do other things. We can add speech to it. We could add music to it, except hams don't do that. We're not junior disc jockeys, by the way. And we can send data. We're going to talk about this later, but how do we modulate? How do we take this, that radio wave and put information on it? Many different ways. We can vary its amplitude. We can vary its frequency. We can vary its phase. We'll talk about that in a little bit. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about it right now. We talked about one cycle being a certain wavelength and the number of cycles in a given time as its frequency. What if we take that wave and temporarily move it in time back and forth. That's referred to as phase modulation. And we do that on VHF. We do it all the time. What we call frequency modulation is in many cases phase modulation and we'll get into that later as well. Morse code, simple. We turn it off and on. The transmitter stays lit up but we simply turn off and on its transmitting capabilities and we do that with a switch known as a telegraph key or a Morse key. Amplitude modulation, uh, we take the carrier which is at a constant level and we add speech to it and we 
modulate it by varying the intensity or the amplitude high and low along with our speech. So when we talk into the microphone, because the, uh, the amount of power that the transmitter generates to vary. Did I move, Joe? And so we end up with uh, this waveform. AM is a very old method. Uh, the earliest broadcasters used AM, still around today. But a radio signal comprises a certain width. We had that one chart a little bit ago where it occupied a certain amount of width on the spectrum. So those stations could not be too close together or they would interfere with each other, they would overlap. The reason is because we have a carrier frequency and then we have sidebands. We have frequencies on both sides of that carrier that are also occupied. That entire carrier and sidebands together is called a composite signal. The amount of bandwidth that we occupy varies with the information that we're transmitting. A Morse code signal requires very little bandwidth and we can pack a lot of them into a band. When we put AM stations in a band, they each occupy a much greater bandwidth and so we can have fewer of them stacked in there. Here we're at 800 on the AM radio dial, 800 kilohertz. We're gonna generate um, a tone at 600 hertz. Okay, kind of a low whistle. We transmit that, we whistle into the microphone. What we would see then on a spectrum analyzer, a piece of test equipment that looks at the frequency versus the amplitude, we would see our carrier at precisely 800 kilohertz. We would see some more energy at 800.6, in other words, 800 kilohertz plus 600 hertz, there's our tone, and we'll see some more energy at 800 kilohertz minus 600 hertz or 799.4 kilohertz, and that's what we would be transmitting. But radio stations don't just whistle into the microphone, they talk. So what we're more likely to see is this. If you were to look at the spectrum of an AM station, you would basically see stuff on both sides rising and falling as the announcer talked. And you would see a group of frequencies on the positive side of the carrier and another group of frequencies on the negative side of the carrier all being used. Nonetheless, this entire width is being used by that radio station. Does the radio station have to then own that width? Yeah. Of, so that the, in a sense the man has to talk at a certain... That's why you have a transmitter with circuitry built into it Demonic. to limit you okay. to that width. Yeah, it's not up to the announcer or the disc jockey to worry about that. That's the station engineer yeah. and the transmitter has to be adjusted so as to not occupy more than this. Because guess what? There's another station over here and another station over here. You get better propagation with sideband. Yes. True? Yes. Why didn't broadcast radio set up for sideband at the beginning rather than fiddle around with a fundamental frequency? Sideband wasn't invented until the 50s, and AM goes back to the earliest days of radio. There's also less resolution. This is more, uh, well, on purpose we restrict sideband because we don't need beautiful high fidelity sound. But radio stations are now starting to buy sidebands, is that how we have mega radio stations that are sort of loading no. all the little stations? No, the sideband is part and parcel of the, of the radio station. I mean, okay. uh, if you want to build a radio station and you can actually find an open frequency and you convince the FCC to grant you that frequency and you build your station, uh, you are limited to a 10 kilohertz bandwidth no matter how much money you have. I mean, that's just a technical specification. So how wide is this? Well. Typically, we talk about on ham radio uh, a 300 or 3,000 hertz um, bandwidth. Uh, a human voice has most of its energy between 300 and 3,000 hertz. So, if we were to build our radios such that they would carry 3,000 hertz of bandwidth, it'd be sort of like a telephone telephone quality. 
So on ham radio, when you're talking to somebody, you'll know who it is. Their voice will have those characteristics, like you know when you're talking to your mom or your brother on a telephone. Um, it's not high fidelity, but it's communications quality. Well, we have two sidebands, one over here that goes from zero to three kilohertz, and we have another sideband going from zero to minus three kilohertz, so we are occupying six kilohertz total. Is this range why there's distortion if you're talking too loudly? Yeah, um, there are circuits inside the transmitters that make sure you don't go too wide, and if you overdrive it, it will clip that signal and you will create distortion. Overmodulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, do most, how come most of our radios, our handheld, do not have sideband, do they? Oh, they do. That's why we cannot put your conversation right next to another conversation just a few hertz away. You're, you're given 15 kilohertz. You can't regulate just sideband, up to sideband, lower sideband, right? On a, a when you say regulate it, you can choose. We, we have, we'll talk about that. But yes, you can choose to use just one sideband or the other, but it takes more circuitry inside the radio to do that. That's why. Mm -hmm. Simple AM modulation, which is what we're talking about here, creates sidebands, an upper sideband and a lower sideband, just because that's how it works. And there's math behind it, but essentially an AM signal will have an upper sideband and a lower sideband, and that's just the way it works. Now you can choose to not transmit one of those sidebands and you do it by removing one of them. You filter it inside the radio and you transmit just one sideband. But guess what? At the receiving end, if that receiver has an ordinary AM detector in it, he doesn't hear you very well. It's going to be all distorted. So what the radio has to do is restore the other sideband. But because it's symmetrical, it's doable with circuitry. And that's why when you hear a, a ham tuning an HF radio up and down the band, you'll hear Donald Duck type, type speech. And as you tune across it, the speech becomes more and more intelligible, and then less and less as you tune away from him. Your radio is restoring the other sideband, but you keep moving the frequency with your tuning dial, and so uh, the signal will become intelligible, and then less as you go up and down. On the other hand, we're only occupying how much? 3,000 hertz instead of 6,000 hertz. So sideband, single sideband is the technical name for it, uh, is much more efficient by double. And so on the HF ham bands, everybody uses single sideband because we can pack twice the conversations into a given space. Mostly upper sideband, is there a convention? It depends on the band. There is a gentleman's agreement. Isn't it how much above dying? I don't, Joe, what is it? 20 upper, uh, 20 up through whatever. 20 meters is upper side band. Lower side band is 40. 40 meters, meters lower side, side band. Only because that's what everybody else is doing. I don't know what's 60, Dave, you know? Everything above 40 is all lower. Oh, it's all lower. <clears throat> so I think that's... It's more efficient because the power is distributed only on one side. That's another reason. It's more efficient because we don't have to worry about the other side band. We can make our receivers filtering narrower. And anytime you can narrow down the filter and the amount of bandwidth you have to receive, you're more efficient all other things being equal. But also, yes, you can put more power into the upper sideband because you're not putting power into the lower sideband and you're not transmitting the carrier. That's a big chunk of energy right there. So removal of the sideband is done when you start with an AM signal, you uh -huh. run that through a tune circuit, is that how you get it? There's, there's modulators that work that way. They simply transmit one sideband or the other, or you can filter it. If you go for your general license, we'll go into great detail on this. <laughs> How about other types of modulation? We know that if we, we can vary the amplitude. We just spent some time on that. How about if we vary the frequency? Wouldn't that work? Sure, we can vary the frequency. And if we do that in cadence with our voice, we can be heard at the other end if they have a, a, the proper demodulator. Uh, this is FM. Now people say, AM is not as good as FM because on my AM radio, the stations aren't high fidelity, but on my FM radio, the signals are high fidelity. It's not because of the type of modulation we're using, it's because on the AM dial, we're only allowed 10 kilohertz of bandwidth. And we're using six kilohertz of that to send upper sideband and lower sideband. And then we have a little guard band, and then we have another radio station. 
On FM, we've got what? Stations every 200 kilohertz, right? 107.9, 107.7, 200 kilohertz. Those stations have 100 kilohertz in which to play. So much, much higher fidelity. Of course, they have sidebands too. But um, they're given much more space. The reason that FM is superior to AM is because lightning, electric fences, neon signs, um, car ignition systems radiate interference, noise. Noise is amplitude modulated for the most part. If you have a receiver that is sensitive to amplitude modulation, you hear this stuff. If you have a radio that's not sensitive to amplitude modulation, it's only sensitive to changes in frequency, it can ignore static, lightning discharges, man-made noises, those kinds of things. So FM is superior in that way. Now, I'm, I'm old school military. Now, the FMs that we had in our trucks were line of sight. Mm -hmm. just get it done because, but our AM radios, we were able to talk to my rack all the way back here. And not because it's AM or FM, but because of the band that it's on. Your AM radios were on much lower frequencies where you could put up big antennas and talk long distances. Your FM radios had short antennas and they were probably at 100 or a couple hundred megahertz. Much shorter range at those frequencies because of the way that radio waves propagate. And, and we'll talk about that. What about phase modulation? This is kind of strange to a lot of people because it looks just like FM. If, if we change the phase of the signal, aren't we also changing its frequency? Well, yes, you are. But phase modulation is kind of a temporary change in frequency and it goes right back to the original frequency, whereas on FM, if you were to generate a, a DC signal and feed it into an FM radio, the frequency would change and stay changed. It wouldn't just move and come back again. It's a deep subject that we'll cover in a more uh, detailed class. Uh, but in fact, both of them are used on VHF. There is a standard that says that we are going to take our FM signal and treat it so that it's phase modulated. But in fact, uh, both are used interchangeably on, uh, on high frequency, uh, VHF and UHF. Here's a list of some of the bandwidths you'll encounter. AM voice is six kilohertz, why? We have two sidebands, each one is three kilohertz wide. AM broadcast, KOA, KCOL, all the big guys, WBBM in Chicago, WLS. They have a, they're allowed 10 kilohertz of width. They can operate a lot of power of some of those stations and they can talk all across the country, um, but they are limited to that much bandwidth. Um, video, uh, TV stations, the video portion of a TV signal, six megahertz wide. Um, how about sideband? We only transmit one sideband or the other, upper or lower, and so that's gonna end up being down in that three kilohertz region. SSB, uh, single sideband is what that means. Uh, there are digital modes that we can use to transmit sideband. Um, depending on the mode you're in, you can use up that much frequency. Um, Morse code, uh, CW is an expression Continuous wave, it goes way back to the earliest days of radio. We use it to mean Morse code. So when you hear somebody talk about CW, that's what they mean. As you can see, Morse code is by far the narrowest of all these bands, bandwidths. We can pack a lot of CW stations into the Morse code portion of the 40 meter band or the 80 meter band. And that's kind of why a lot of people like it. You can tune across all sorts of signals and the human brain also is very capable he has a very good question. Um, he's, he's dealing with a ARRL book, okay. and he can't understand what you're saying compared to what they're doing. Okay. What's the I can't follow it in the book, the book we're supposed to get. I can't follow some of these diagrams and stuff you're getting yeah. up there related to the book. So, so yeah. far, I'm trying to have to keep up, and I can't see what's going on in here. Well, I'm not attempting to follow the book. I'm just following the slide, and they were created separately. Um, well, the important thing is, is that you learn the terms because that's what the, the test is going to be on. Uh, is this, these books, um, unfortunately, 
were written by two different people, so very different slides. So to follow the book and figure that the slides are not are going to go on, they're not. Well, I'm finding I can't keep fast enough notes <laughs> to, to read oh, well, what you're saying. That, 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 Bob, you know that. <laughs> okay. Are the slides available somewhere? Well, I think so. Joe, are, are the slides online? Okay, well, that's part of the instructor package. Yeah. Um, let me get clearance, but I think it could be. I, I need clearance made of URL. Well, I tell you what. Um, at the end of each module, there are questions and answers, like we've gone through a couple times. There are many websites that you can go to where those questions are there. And you can answer the questions. And if you can make it through answering all the questions and get a high score, you're in. Tamexam.org has a study mode, which is really useful. It's free. You go to Tamexam.org. What is it? Tamexam.org. Thank you. Just like it sounds. Um, you can sign up or not. It doesn't matter. You select the test on the left-hand side that you want to take, uh, which is the technician. And you can either do a study or you can do a, a practice test. In the study mode, when you answer a question wrong, below, it'll actually give you an ex explanation of the proper answer, which is not 100% these slides, but it's, it's, the information is identical, so you get the exact information that way. And if you go through that just over and over and over again, you will learn all of this stuff as well. And by the time you're done in the class next, uh, next Saturday, you'll have all the terms, you'll understand what's going on. And on top of that, you'll have all the answers to the questions on Amazon.org are the questions that you will see on your test. It's like they are identical. There you go. Okay, Morse code, very efficient. We can operate very little bandwidth there. And the human brain is very good at being able to discern between tones. So that you might be tuned in to a place on the band where there's like three people carrying on conversations in Morse code, but they're gonna be with different tones and you'll be able to concentrate on one of them and write down what they're saying and ignore the other two. It's pretty remarkable how the, the brain becomes a good filter. Uh, FM voice, in other words, hams using handheld radios talking back and forth on an FM channel, like on two meters, 10 to 15 kilohertz is the bandwidth that we're taking up. And finally, FM broadcast, uh, 88.9 on the radio dial. They're occupying 150 kilohertz out of the 200 kilohertz that they're allowed, because 200 kilohertz away is another station. So, the modulation is commercial video broadcast. Uh, AM, if it's, um, it's called vestigal sideband. So if you were to tune in the original analog channel two mm -hmm. on, on a TV set, an old TV set, you would be essentially receiving something similar to single sideband on the video. Um, today, everything is being done digitally. So you can kind of forget those theories. <laughs> Wasn't the voice of FM though? Yes. I mean, the, 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 um, the video I, signal was AM and the voice was FM. Yeah, a video signal is actually quite complicated. There is, uh, there's color information, there's video amplitude information, and there's audio. And, it, and it's a big chunk set aside for each channel. I think the old uh, cell phones had analog, digital, and they had three different... The original bricks, yeah. Well, your the digital uh, broadcast television nowadays, all those UHF and VHF antennas that people took off their house, they're putting them back up. But, well, not those antennas, but different antennas, <laughs> because this literally, they literally re, they took the UHF and VHF broadcast signals um, and uh, reapplied them to digital. So now it's the literally exact bandwidth, just a completely different type of information, which is why you can get much clearer, brighter signals because they're using <coughs> a different type of modulation. Well, and those frequencies are coveted. Other people wanted the TV stations to move so they could have those channels for other purposes. And, they, and those frequencies can be sold by the government, so it's a good source of income. Let's go through some questions and then we'll, we'll take a break. Why should you not set your transmitter frequency to e exactly the edge of a band? For example, the 75 meter band ends at 4.0 megahertz. Why, do, why would you not set your transmitter to 4.0? Yeah. Survey says, D? Yeah. For one thing, what if your transmitter isn't exactly calibrated perfectly? 
For another thing, how about those sidebands? If your transmitter dial says 4.000 megahertz, what about the sideband that goes up another three kilohertz? And your transmitter could potentially drift a bit. So we better operate just a little bit short of the band edge. What's transmitter frequency drift? You know, these days, transmitters are pretty darn good. They're synthesized. They have crystal oscillators and then a microprocessor that creates additional frequencies from that. They don't drift much. But there's nothing to prevent you from using an old tube transmitter from years ago, a, a boat anchor. And, and they can drift. So you better take that into account when you set the frequency that it's operating on. So generally, those tubed radios, as they warmed up, their frequency would drift a little bit yeah, as, right, until they got to operating range. So. However, Bob said uh, a boat anchor, not, they won't work real well under water. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't mean. Uh, and if you go to a ham fest, you'll find all manner of radios being sold from very old antique radios to very modern transceivers and the performance level is really quite remarkable on, on modern radios as opposed to the old one. But a lot of guys will collect old radios and use them, which is perfectly legal, just because it's fun. There are guys operating on 10 meter AM uh, using antiquated equipment and they're just there because they like the sound of it. It's got a nice fidelity. Okay. Um, what determines the amount of deviation? Well, we didn't talk about that, but it turns out the louder you yell into an FM radio, the wider that signal becomes. So FM radios have limiters built into them to make sure that you can't go too wide because then you're stepping on your neighbor's toes. What happens if you increase the deviation of an FM transmitter? Uh, this word deviation, Here's the frequency that you're supposed to be transmitting on, 146.52 megahertz. Deviation is the amount of, that the frequency will move up and down as you talk. Well, if you yell, the deviation allows you to go wider and consequently you occupy more space. So that's why FM radios are adjusted at the factory or by a friendly ham neighbor of yours. You can always get in there with a screwdriver and set the deviation so you don't get too wide. What is a form of amplitude modulation? How about removing one of the sidebands? What type of modulation is most commonly used for VHF packet radio? Well, we didn't talk about it yet, but packet is the transmission of data on typically VHF and UHF frequencies. And so we are taking the carrier and moving it back and forth for the ones and zeros of the data stream. And that's FM. Which type of voice modulation is most often used for long distance or weak signal contacts on VHF and UHF? Now this is a whole other area that some people really enjoy. How far can we talk with our radios? Can we bounce our signal off the moon? Can we bounce it off a meteor trail, an ionized meteor trail perhaps? That's weak signal. You need big antennas and you have to be able to aim them to do this. It's done with AM because it's more, we can make our detectors very narrow band listening for a, a really weak return signal from those, those reflective surfaces. How about repeaters? Well, the handhelds and the mobiles and the things that we use for emergency communications to keep in touch on a local level, those are all FM. Which one has the narrowest bandwidth? CW, good old Morse code. Which sideband do we use for 10 meter HF, VHF, and UHF single sideband? As Dave mentioned before, everything above 40 meters is? Twenty. 40 is lower. 40 is lower side. Oh, 20 meters and up is, okay. All right. 
And as technicians, you have access to some HF frequencies. What is the primary advantage of single sideband over FM? Well, single sideband means we left off one of the sidebands. Our signal is only 3 kilohertz wide. What was the FM bandwidth? 10 to 15 kilohertz. We can pack more sideband stations on a band. What's the bandwidth of a single sideband voice signal? Single sideband, one sideband, three kilohertz. How about a VHF repeater FM phone, phone meaning voice signal? Well, what did we say FM was for amateur for two-way radio? 10 to 15 kilohertz. You should know that depending on where in the country you are, repeaters are sometimes spaced at 15 kilohertz increments and sometimes at 20 kilohertz increments. Pretty much uh, the Pacific Northwest is 20 kilohertz, everything east is 15 kilohertz, and in between it's either way. What is it R here? 15? 15. What's the bandwidth of an analog FASCAN TV transmission? Well, you can, you can transmit FM uh, you can transmit a TV signal between your shack and somebody else's shack and you can be in front of a camera and the other person can see you in real time just like the broadcasters do, if you wish. It's a hobby that some people around here practice. But the standards are the same as regular FM, uh, regular television. It requires a 6 megahertz bandwidth. You're going to occupy a good chunk of the band. <laughs> Uh, I think this is repetitious, huh? How wide is a CW signal? It's the narrowest of all, right? This presentation was brought to you by the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club. For more information, visit our website, ncarc.net. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.